Okay, so um, hi everyone, and thank you so much for coming to our virtual vigil for Black Lives Matter and solidarity with the Global Black Caucus. I hope everyone's family, friends, and loved ones are safe at this time. My name is Kim, and I am the chair of Democrats Abroad China. What is happening now is an injustice to us all and truly heartbreaking. I would like to quote Killer Mike from his emotional speech in Atlanta, Georgia, given the other day. He said, quote, I am duty bound to be here to simply say that it is your duty not to burn your own house down for anger with an enemy. It is your duty to fortify your own house so that you may be a house of refuge in times of organization. And now is the time to plot, plan, strategize, organize, and mobilize in an effective way. It's time to beat up prosecutors you don't like at the voting booth. It is time to hold mayoral offices accountable, chiefs and deputy chiefs. That's the end of his part, now me. Let us collectively no longer sit in silence. I specifically mean all of us allies, Asian, white, Hispanic, that have largely been silent before. Let us change and transform the sadness, guilt, fear, and anger into meaningful action and talk to our communities on why if we want to rise, we need to rise together. If you're feeling anguish beyond what you think is healthy for you, understand that you can only help others as much as you help yourself first. I will be dropping a link for free counseling within China from an amazing organization called Lifeline in the chat. Thank you so much for your time, and I will pass this back to Brittany. All right. Thank you, Kim. Um, next, we have T Bird Love, and T Bird Love is a leading contemporary performer who has developed an enormously diverse way of conveying music through flute and voice. At the age of 16, she performed in the side-by-side -side concert with the Pittsburgh Symphony under the direction of Lauren Maisel. Her mission to inspire all of us to make the world a better place from our unique point of view has taken her to stages such as TEDx in San Francisco and Shanghai, Festival Awe Desert in Mali, Africa. Today, she lives in Shanghai building heart building heart-centered communities and leading workshops and trainings that empower individuals to be role models for global transformational transformation through the work that they do in the world. And T-Bird could not uh, be here today, but she has left a video she wanted to uh, share with you. So I'm going to share that video with you right now. As soon as I can get it, wait a moment. Okay, and can you give me a thumbs up if you can see it? <laughs> Great, thank you. It is Tanya Ridgely. People call me T-Bird Love, and um, it's an honor to be here with all of you even though I'm doing a video for you, um, but I can feel you in the system. And it's beautiful that we can come together to demonstrate that the violence against blacks has to stop, that the violence happening in the US is insane, and that really the violence all over the world that is taking place, it's our old story and it's time to have a new story. So it's an honor to be here with all of you today. Um, I'm sitting here in New York City right now and holding so much of the complexity of what's happening in the world and how uh, in the year 2020 that we're still Managing this is insane. I'm 
usually a person of tons of words, but um, instead I'm going to play for you and just say thank you. Okay, and thank you to T-Bird. And uh, sorry, I know some people could not see the video. We will share that video uh, with you. There's just some issues with uh, my screen. So I won't be able to show anything from my screen right now. I, I'm not sure how to fix that. So sorry for your technical difficulties there. Um, next up, we have... Next up, we have our Global Black Caucus uh, Laureate. Jasmine Cochran, and she will be reading um, a poem and saying some comments for us. So let's welcome Jasmine. Jasmine, can you unmute yourself? Yep, I'm, I'm trying. Oh, <laughs> I'm trying to start <laughs> welcome. Here we go. <laughs> Um, my video looks a little bit blurry. I don't know. Can you guys see me there? Yeah, you look great. Love your hair. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, I just want to first say thank you to everybody for being here tonight. It's been a very emotional few weeks. Um, I'm just going to dive right into this. I've spent the last two days writing this piece for tonight. Tonight, I just have a short list, but may our brothers and sisters who have lost their lives at the hands of those who swore to protect us all as part of a system that was never meant for us, find a way to rest in peace. And may we find a way to dismantle that system and replace it with one that works so that you won't have died in vain. Trayvon Martin, Ayanna Jones, Freddie Gray, Natasha McKenna, Sam DeVos, Philando Castile, Terrence Crutcher, India Cager, Alton Sterling, Jeremy McDowell, Stephen Taylor, Walter Scott, Tamir Rice, Akai Gurley, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, Sandra Bland, Jordan Edwards, Botham John, Ahmaud Arbery, 2.23 miles out for a run. Some Georgia boys filled him with bullets, but we don't learn until two months later about this ex-cop vigilante and his son. Breonna Taylor, an EMT, sleep in her bed. Police rained down a storm of bullets, but no cops have been indicted. They arrested her watchful boyfriend instead. George Floyd a man of character and stature who stood for something, killed on a curb with kneecaps in his neck. The camel's back was fractured. Land of the free, built on murder, theft, and rape. Maybe collectively woke up, said, now I see it. Revolution's taking shape. Near and far, the world was sick, but felt the fracture. They ascended like a rapture, stepped in unison, proclaiming Black Lives Matter. Equality don't come on silver platters. The world won't rest again till Black Lives Matter. 
that last line is my hope that this is not just a one-off, that the people who we see now who are aligning as allies are in it for the long haul. And that at this point, we can get together, we can align, we can focus, we can organize, and we can really do something that can change the future of the USA so that when it's time for us to go home, we won't be scared to. So that if my kids want to grow up there, they can and they can feel like that's home. And that's for all of us. I'm glad you guys are here tonight. And may we move forward in power and success. Thank you, Jasmine, so much. That was powerful. And I just want to personally mention um, that she's right. Um, that I hope that this isn't a one-off and the people who are standing here as our allies uh, continue to stand uh, with us um, because you know no fight is easily won and it takes time and we have to keep up that momentum. I think that is so uh, important right now because if we're going to have justice. I'm sorry. For our community, we need to, we can't give up. We cannot give up this country because we should be able to walk through this country that our ancestors fought for and not fear for our lives. So I just, as, I, as Jasmine said, you continue to stand with us and, you know, don't give up the fight. Uh, uh, sorry. So the next person um, that will be speaking for us is uh, Jay Carter. Jay Carter, he's a black conservationist, a humanitarian activist, an AmeriCorps alumni and political consultant. He has worked with uh, government agencies to protect and promote public lands for park visitors and wildlife habitats. Uh, Jay, I'm going to unmute you. Are you ready, Jay? Yes. Um, that was very, uh, very moving, Jasmine. And I'm just every like, I'm sorry. I, I'm almost lost for words because I did not have really any attention to express my emotions and. Um, the past few days I've been very, uh, like everybody, just trying to figure it out, really, to be honest. Um, with all of my experience and both across the states of America and even living and working in China, and just losing, you know, I lost a brother in prison. Um, you know, simply due to injustice system. And uh, in 2018, I, you know, I uh, went out in protest and it was a day that I would never forget. So I'm going to start with my, um, one of my lost brother is Antoine Rose Jr. Um, he was actually a family member. And so I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And this poem is, I'm not what you think. <clears throat> And it was written by Antoine Rose uh, before he was shot three times in the back. And that was the day that I won't forget because it was, it's one thing to hear about, you know, another black young person or another black person in general getting shot across the country of America. But it's another thing to hear about it when it's one of your own people, one of your own family members within your own city. And so here we go. I'm confused and afraid. I wonder what path I will take. I hear that there's only two ways out. I see mothers bury their sons. I want my mom to never feel that pain. I'm confused and afraid. I pretend all is fine. I feel like I'm suffocating. I touch nothing, so I believe all is fine. I worry that it isn't enough. 
I cry no more. I'm confused and afraid. I understand people believe I'm just a statistic. I say to them I'm different. I dream of life getting easier. I try my best to make my dream true. I hope that it does. I'm confused and afraid by Antoine Rose Jr. He died on June the 19th, 2018. And it was an honor to meet his mother. We've been fighting here in Pittsburgh, trying to bring justice, but we can't do this without white, al white allies or all, all allies. This is a fight for all of us because it's the same thing w which we know. If folks don't stand up for one group when they are being suppressed and killed, then who would stand up for you? So I don't really have words. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. And we need to do better. And I just pray that it doesn't stop here, that we continue to have these open, honest conversations because we're not just burning down properties because we think that that's the, we're burning them down because it's, we don't believe that this is our America. And I can't speak for everybody. But if we don't figure out a solution and stop this racist, narcissistic, ego, police brutality, and what have you, it's time for a revolution. If we don't come together and we don't figure it out and right the wrong, 400 plus years of slavery of our people, and we don't call it out from the top of this president administration and all the way down to the white neighbor that just likes to pick a fight with, you know, someone because of the color of their skin. If we don't start to come together and call things out for what it is and hold them accountable, we are just as guilty and we have blood on our hand as our own enemy. I don't have anything else to say. I just thank you guys for being here and for sharing your stories. Because what you're looking at today with all of my successes means nothing. When I walk out the door, I'm just another black person. It's time for all of us to wake up. I'm tired of protesting. I protested since I was 15. It's not enough. Thank you, Jay. Thank you so much for sharing your own experience and opening up to us. And you're right. We need to wake up. This is, you know, the system isn't working for us. And uh, we're tired of hearing that people want the black vote. Black people and young black people are tired because they keep saying they want our vote. They're going to change the system, um, but nothing has changed for us. So we hope that in this election that, you know, you're not just asking for our vote that you're standing with us to bring systematic change because it has to happen uh, or we can't go keep going forward like this. And you can't keep asking for our vote and then not helping us move forward. So thank you, uh, thank you, Jay. Uh, next up we have Dr. Kimberly Stowe. She is the United Nations uh, Ambassador at large. Uh, she's a U.S. boxing princess and first lieutenant U.S. Armed, of the U.S. Armed Forces. She's going to give us a statement in light of the most recent tragedies of our, of our community. Let's see, Kimberly.
Kimberly. Are I'm you... here. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, so I'm going to try and say this as quick as possible without getting emotional. Um, this has been a really hard, long, rough week, and we're all trying to deal with it as best as we can. So I am saddened that we meet under such circumstances, but overjoyed by the outpouring of effort and support by each individual here. I felt compelled to speak up and out. I am torn for I am in the middle of both. I have family and friends who work within our government system as politicians, attorneys, judges, and police officers who put on the badge every day to protect and serve. At the same time, I have both family members and friends who have fallen victim to the abuse of violence, misuse of power, and overwhelming abundance of racism. Now, although I know they have not and would never participate in such acts, I feel we must call for appropriate actions to be taken, not only for those directly responsible for overt acts of violence and the use of deadly force, but for those who are indirectly responsible as well. If they are witness to such acts and do not step in, to stop such torture, vigilante BS, they too are just as guilty. In a criminal system, when one is charged with his role as the ringleader, others can be charged as accessories to the crime for, they, for their role. There should be no difference here for these officers broke the oath they've taken to protect and serve and become destroyers as vigilantes and criminals who no longer deserve to wear the badge. We must keep in mind, we can demand justice without inserting violence, without replicating the very same behaviors for which we are protesting against. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe in our system full heartedly. It's some, many of people within. It is that who is doing wrong. It is those who are doing wrong. We must put a checks and balance system in place for those bad apples that slip through the cracks. It is up to each one of us to make our voice heard by ensuring we get out and vote, to take accountability for those who choose to represent us, and we have the right people in place to prevent such ongoing devastation. Voting is power. Voting is our livelihood. Voting is our nation. Voting is of the most importance, so we must stand together and become the most synchronized voice we can, where our vote, is heard loud and clear. We will stand for nothing less. No more violence. I love you all and want nothing but peace, serenity, and prosperity. For in my world, all lives matter. Black lives matter. My life matters. In the slaughter of our people, I beg of you, and we, the people, need to band together in reaching back to our roots of the MLK. In a nonviolent approach and take an appropriate stance, George was all about community. Let's stand in his honor and honor him in the way that he would want. Thank you guys for listening. I just want us all to get through this as best as we can, but in a sense of making positive steps, meaningful steps, not just having this for naught, a protest that went nowhere, a protest that didn't mean anything and set for that moment. We must get out of that. We must stand together and start making more actions, powerful actions, and get those people to represent us. No, no, no longer can we stand for this, no longer. So thank you guys for listening and I have nothing else to say. Thank you, Dr. Stowe, for uh, sharing your words with us. And she's absolutely um, correct. We, we have to keep mo moving forward and through the power of our vote, and not only through the power of our vote, but getting behind organizations that are trying to bring change, such as uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, the Black Lives Matter organization and uh, Colors of Change, um, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, uh, and I just speak, uh, and I say these organizations not on behalf of the Democrats abroad, but on behalf of myself, because these, um, these are organizations that have been working 
um, since uh, the unjust killing of Trayvon Martin to you know bring about change and uh, the NAACP even longer so we need to support these organizations we need to get back into our community and start at the grassroots too um, especially for our allies uh, it's voting but it's starting at the grass grassroots and going into your community speaking with your families and friends to uh, bring about change next up we have uh, Charmaine Thomas from Oklahoma, uh, who is falling in love with living life as an author and writer. She's an inspirational speaker, aspiring actor and director, producer. See, she is affectionately known as Red and publicly known as MC from Heaven. And she will be sharing her story with us. Okay. Right, Charmaine, are you able to unmute yourself? Yes, can everybody hear me? Yes, ma'am. All right, okay. I wanna first got this message. Well, first I wanna show y'all my shirt. This is the platform that I have created in Shanghai. It's ironic that in this time, the platform is called I Am Enough, which is a creative art storytelling platform that you know has reached so many people around the entire world. And when, I watched the six and a half minute video of what happened with <clears throat> when I watched the six and a half minute video that happened with George Floyd, it brought me back to the moment when I was standing on I-35 in Oklahoma City and I had just dropped my dad off who has this long record and I've never had one. And I just dropped him off at church and I was on my way to church. And there was this officer tailgating me. I wasn't speeding or doing anything because it's a Sunday. Any American knows you're most likely to get ticketed on a Sunday. And as the officer continued to tailgate me without their lights on, I started to get nervous because they were so close to me. And then as I went, continued to go down the highway, I saw another officer pulled over. They had somebody pulled over and it was side to side tra side to side bumper to bumper traffic. And for all of you who know in, in America, it says, you know, the law is for you to pull over or slow down for emergency vehicles. Now I was not being pulled over. I saw the officer pulled off to the shoulder. And because the officer that was tailgating me was tailgating me so closely and very in, an, in such an intimidating way, I tried to move over to the right to get away from the officer that was on the shoulder and no cars would let me in. So I pulled myself over. And as soon as I started to pull myself over, the officer turned the lights on. So I pull over on the side of the road and I open up because not everybody here is black. And if you don't understand and haven't understood, understand this today. What we are taught in our homes is different. And so what we have to do the moment we get approached by law enforcement or even your authority figures and superiors who do not look like you, we are taught differently. And so because of what I was taught in my home, I knew that my truck window didn't roll down and I opened my door slowly and put my hands on the steering wheel and said, officer, my window doesn't roll down. I'm just letting you know, that's why I'm opening my door. And as I had my hands on the steering wheel, the officer pulls up to me and is yelling and just telling me that, actually, I don't even remember everything she was saying. And I was so alarmed and just trying to remain calm and just ask the officer, what have I done? And initially, the officer told me, and I'm sure you're wondering by now, was this a white cop? Absolutely. And it was a white woman cop. And I asked the officer once, you know, she calmed down just a little bit. I asked, you know, well, what have I done for you to pull me over? And the officer says, well, I don't have to tell you. And I said, okay. And I just sit there and I wait, you know, for her to calm down. And in the midst of this, she's saying a lot of derogatory things to me. And <clears throat> she then decides that she's going to give me a ticket. And I said, officer, 
why are you giving me a ticket? And she tells me, I don't have to tell you why you're getting a ticket. And so at this point, I start to panic and get nervous. And I don't know if this is a, I didn't know for me at this, at this time, if this was going to be a moment in history where I needed to stand my ground or if I just, you know, needed to bow down, you know, whatever. I had no idea. I was barely 20 something years old. I was in my mid 20s. And this happened two days before President Obama was elected. So she hands me the ticket and I tell her, I said, I don't believe I can sign this ticket if you can't tell me what it is that I have done wrong. And so she tells me she's arresting me and she proceeds to do so. So right out there on I-35, in front of everybody traveling between Oklahoma and Texas, she pulls me out of my vehicle, leaves my door open. All of my belongings are there. She puts the handcuffs on me so tight that my hands immediately went numb. And then the officer that we had just passed, he pulls up. And now there are three white officers looking at me. And once she gets me into the back seat of her car and starts to tell me basically how stupid I am and how I don't know how to drive and how I put this officer's life in danger. And I did this and I did that, but she couldn't give me a reason as to why she pulled me over. As I'm sitting there in the back seat of the car with my hand cut, with my hands tied behind my back and handcuffs that I can't, my hands, I can't even feel them. I look out the window and the two officers are pointing and laughing at me. And at that moment, I started to think in my mind, I said, I hate white people. I hate them. I hate them. And I just said it over and over in my head. I said, I hate them. I hate them. I hate them. I hate white people. So for those of you here, hopefully people around the world. Well, number one, let's get this straight. It's not all the protesters that are burning things down. Some of that is happening because people are trying to collect insurance money. Let's just be real about that. And while I don't agree with burning things down, sometimes that is the way that you do have to send the message. And I would prefer that not to happen. But the anger at that moment that I felt I could have done the same thing. But me being a middle aged 20 year old, again, a black girl against three white officers, in my mind, as I'm saying, I hate white people, I started to sit there and think about every white person that has ever been kind to me. And I immediately repented and I said, Lord, it is not right for me to have hate in my heart. And I will not do that. I will not hate people that I don't even know and people who have done amazing things to me and believed in me because of this moment. And as I continue to sit there, knowing that I'm outnumbered, I started to think, you know what? I know how this story goes. Today, if I decide to stand my ground, then I will be George Floyd. I will be Sandra Bland. I will be on that list. And so I decided I will sign the ticket. I told her I will sign the ticket. I don't want my family to have to wonder what happened. Knowing that my voice would be silenced for an eternity and they would never know. And so when she finally took me out of the car and I signed the ticket, my hands were shaking so bad, I couldn't even sign it. And here she is just steadily just yelling at me. And I'm in tears, I'm like breaking, like at the moment. And then I go back and I get in my truck and I'm trying to pull myself together so I can make that hour long drive back to my university at the time. Oh, I was going to a Christian university. And then she gets on her speaker, her bullhorn, and she says, Miss Thomas, I said, move it. And I was just like, God, help me, please help me. I was shaking so bad, I didn't know if I could drive and I was all by myself. I didn't have anyone to go to at that moment. So I just shifted my vehicle in gear and just left. 
and tried to keep myself from breaking on the way back to school. And then when I got there and got to see my three white roommates, like what's wrong? And when I decide to tell them what's wrong, they say, oh, well, maybe she was just having a bad day. And I think of anything that's probably the most important thing that I can say is because this is how this type of behavior perpetuates. This is how it continues. No, you can't tell me that I had another white friend in college who cursed out an officer and I'm sitting in the back seat and I can hear you cursing out the officer. You're going 80 in a 65. And this white girl can curse out an officer and walk away with a warning, but I get pulled over and you tell me you don't have to tell me anything and you're arresting me? So to my white brothers and sisters in Christ, this is how you help. The protesting is wonderful, it's beautiful, but this, these are the conversations that you have in your home. These are the conversations that you have with yourself. You've got to cleanse yourself first. And that doesn't mean black people and Mexicans or any person of color is excluded. You have to cleanse yourself first. And you have those conversations. Just because you can live a life without some of the things that we go through doesn't mean that it is not happening. Just like Martin Luther King says, the moment you become silent is the moment that you die. So in that moment, to be honest with you, to talk to my white roommates and to say, you know what? Maybe she was having a bad day. A bad day? Come on now, when you have a bad day, you mean to tell me you did that because you had a bad day? Stop it. And that's exactly where the communication shut down. And then, you know, Two days later, after President Obama was elected, some officers on campus had stopped myself and another young black woman and said, you know what? The KKK is trying to do demonstrations, so you girls need to go ahead and go home, and you don't need to stay out too late. And the night he got elected, my white roommates looked at me. Now, I don't have a problem saying my age. I'm 35 years old, and I never thought I would see a black president. But when my white friends, my white roommates saw that I was like, oh man, I can't believe this black man really is in office. The hatred that they looked at me was one that I know that you are familiar with seeing. So when I put my hand on the door the next day to go out to campus, I was like, am I really gonna be safe today? Cause you know what, I can't hide my curls and I'm not trying to. I can't hide my skin and I don't want to whiten my skin. I don't wanna bleach my skin, but I can't hide this. I can't. So with that being said, I want to share with you, this is not just an American issue because this is what people are thinking. It's not just an American issue. So I'm gonna hold up my phone here right quick. You see this? And this text message, if y'all can see it, it says, um, we're not sure when kindergartens will start because I'm currently living in Shanghai. I'm from Oklahoma, but I currently live in Shanghai. So I asked, I, I first messaged this recruiter and this is one of about six or seven that I asked. I said, are schools in Shanghai hiring black teachers? The guy says, the kindergarten is not open now. We're not sure when school will start. Kindergartens prefer whites. Kindergarten, and then he says something, you know, about uh, there's no update from the government. So that's one recruiter. So if anybody out there is still thinking that this is just an American issue, it's not. Which is why I said, the conversation has to start by looking yourself in the mirror and also checking the people that you are around. Because if you are silent and that's your friend talking like that, you're perpetuating it. You're allowing that to continue. So here's recruiter number two. No problem. I do have a quick question. Are kindergartens in Shanghai black people? Good morning, Charmaine. Sorry I fell asleep before nine o'clock. As far as I'm concerned, Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Charmaine, uh, because we have our next speakers and uh, it's gone over a little bit and I want to say I greatly appreciate you sharing your story and this is a story that everyone, uh, not everyone, that the black community is familiar with and, you know, as Charmaine said, it starts in the community because we know that, you know, this type of racism and behavior happens you know, within your with, within your own community, your families and friends, and those are the people you need to outreach to because 
they are the ones who are the officers. They are the ones that we have, have to interact with. And our families, sh you know, shouldn't be teaching us that, you know, we need to act and behave a certain way because the way that black parents have to teach their children to go out into the world is that submissive behavior that is something our ancestors went to. So it is just perpetuating, you know, what happened in, you know, slavery and how we should act with, you know, our, our masters. And now we're being told that we need to act and behave a certain way, which is not how it should be. We've had a civil rights movement. We are free and we need to be able to move in this world just as Americans, just as you do. So please do not write off black stories, listen to black stories and speak within your own community. Uh, next we have Sam Wong. I saw that she wanted to speak and let me unmute Sam. Sam? Hey. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I mine is really short and um, I just, sorry. I am so angry um, and I'm so glad that we've all come together, but as someone uh, that looks white and has white family and uh, you know, uh, to everyone else that is on this call that looks white or has, is white and has white family like you can't say that you don't have white family members who need to change um need to change they need to change now and you need to educate them now and you need to reach out now so i'm reaching out now um i'm sending them information like and and i need i need everyone else to do the same and that's it Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam, um, for speaking on behalf of your community. And um, I just want to say that um, I, I just want to thank everyone for coming uh, to our vigil. Sam was our last speaker. And I just want to take a moment um, of silence, just one minute of silence uh, for all the Black lives that have been unjustly taken. Um, from our community. So if everyone, we could just have a, a moment of silence. And thank you. Thank you, everyone, um, for, again, joining us on this call. Um, I believe, Alex, I'm going to unmute you. Did you want to? Sorry. Hey, um, well, I, I, if people want a song, we can do a song together. Uh, there been a lot of powerful speakers uh, tonight. Um, I really appreciate our po poet laureate. Was killed uh, by police officers, uh, and I'll never forget when I was seventeen. Uh, I went to see Wally and Juanita Nelson uh, speak in Coltrane, Massachusetts, and I went with. Reverend Robert Thompson, and uh, who's a friend, who's still a dear friend of mine, and uh, both Wally and Juanita have passed away. Uh, Wally was part of the um, pre Rosa Parks uh, bus um, efforts. Uh, there's a movie called "You Don't Have to Ride Jim Crow," and we went to went to listen. And on the way home, we got pulled over by the police, uh, and the Rev, who was black, was driving, 
and it was a, an amazing lesson for me. Uh, um, and he, uh, just to watch the way he interacted with the police officer uh, and, and eye-opening for me uh, as a white person. Um, and I remember that day because he sang uh, so beautifully uh, at the event that we had attended. Um, and so it was probably about 1993, uh, it would have been 1993. And uh, um, if people want to sing, uh, I, I can take suggestions or I, I have on my screen in front of me, Amazing Grace and We Shall Overcome. So uh, great, let's do We Shall Overcome. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know, Brittany, if you can unmute everybody so that it isn't just my voice. <laughs> okay, everyone's unmuted, I believe. And you can, you can unmute yourselves if you would like. There you go, great. Uh, we shall Shall overcome. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. Well, thank you, Alex, and thank you, everyone, for um, joining and singing us. Yes, I'm not sure if everyone printed a For everyone who um, wrote their own sign, please turn on your camera and, and hold it up. Thank you, this is so beautiful. Thank you everyone for um, joining us during this time. And I just, as we said, I hope we don't stop here. Um, I hope that you've, you know, taken something away from this and you, and you go back to your communities and try to make change there. And continue to support us. We are Americans. We know what we want for our country. We don't want division. We want a country that welcomes different people. That's why people come to America. No matter how many problems we have, like uh, other countries in the world, um, people come here because we're different. We, yeah, I just want to say thank you to everyone and I hope you have a wonderful evening or if you're in America like me have a wonderful morning and make sure you keep in touch so thank you everyone <laughs>